Welcome to Prime Time. I'm Susan Hoskins, the director of the Princeton Senior Resource Center. This is a show for adults in the prime of life. My guest today is Carol Olivieri from the Healthcare Ministry of Princeton. Welcome, Carol. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you today. Tell me a little bit about what the healthcare, or tell our listeners what the healthcare ministry does here in Princeton. The Healthcare Ministry is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's been helping the elderly since 1984 in the greater Princeton community. We have a mission to help the elderly to remain in their homes independently as long as that's safely possible. We accomplish this by providing transportation to health and medical appointments, doing food shopping or taking clients food shopping making friendly visits, and more recently, providing more caregiver support as we're seeing more families caring for their elderly relatives mm -hmm. in their home. We do a lot of this through volunteers, so we are always looking for volunteers to help us with our mission. Despite the fact that we've been here for over 25 years, many people don't realize that we exist, so we're always looking for ways to get the word out about our services, that they're available to the elderly, and also to look for friends who will be supporters to us just as other nonprofits right. in need of financial support. Well, that's one reason I wanted to invite you to join me so that we could give your organization some visibility in the community. Is there any charge for those services? No, our services are free. Are any eligibility requirements or? Most of it is geographic. Mm -hmm. Our people in the greater Princeton community, communities that ring Princeton, uh, also in order to be able to have the rides, since this is provided by volunteers in their own vehicles, the clients need to be fairly mobile. Mm -hmm. This is not the kind of service where we have an incredible manpower to help people who have a lot of physical limitations. So they need to be able to get in and out of a car by themselves? Yes if the driver puts a walker into the trunk that yes. it's manageable but no motorized wheelchairs. <laughs> right, it's not a van service mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you do transportation outside of Princeton then for medical appointments? Like if a person yes. needs to go to um, Jamesburg for radiology or something? We have a specific radius okay. that we go to. So someone should call you and yes, find out if that's available. Um, and Carol's contact information will be up at the end of the show. So what I wanted to talk about today was pets, and I thought you'd be a good guest to talk about this with because you do so many home visits and you see people in their home setting, which a lot of healthcare providers don't yes. get to see. And um, we might talk about what some of the benefits and some of the challenges of older adults having pets might be. So let's start by talking about some of the, the positive aspects of having a pet. Actually, Susan, roughly 20% of our clients have pets, mm. and a number of them have more than one pet. This is a fairly consistent statistic for us. I think it is unusual because we are dealing with the frail elderly. 50% of our population are between 80 and 90, mm. and 25% are over 90. So when we think about individuals who are well in their 90s caring for pets, that's what I mean when I say I think it's, it's unusual because of some of the needs that pets bring with them. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to focus on the service dogs and the therapy animals, even though they're very important to the elderly, because the service animals the prototype of the seeing eye dog and dogs now that are helping people if they have seizures to warn them if they're going to have seizures, uh, some of the chimpanzees or monkeys uh, that are helping disabled people. These are dogs who are really working, mm -hmm. doing tasks, doing jobs. The therapy dogs and cats, these are the animals that people see most commonly in nursing homes or uh, pet visitation in hospitals assisted living facilities. These animals are bringing benefits just by being animals. They're not doing the tasks and my, as the service my dogs. My understanding of them is also that the seniors themselves don't own and, and have responsibility for those, that there are yes. people 
who want to have therapy dogs, they go, the people and the dogs go through the training, they get certified, and then those people go and visit the nursing homes with the dogs. So the dog visits for a couple of hours. I know that they have them visiting schools and children yes. read with the dogs and things yeah. like that. But the the senior is not then responsible for the well-being of the the animal and I so think that's one of the biggest what we're talking about today is those household pets yes exactly mm -hmm. uh, we see um, the the other thing about uh, I'll say the therapy dogs if people mm. are interested they have pets and they think they would like to do those kinds of pet visitations I think that people always need to consider in terms of doing pet visitation having uh, an animal at an assisted living facility or selecting a pet for themselves or for their elderly relative, they need to consider appropriate animals. Mm -hmm. So that just an animal that we may think is a great breed of dog and we love it and it's cute, that may not be the appropriate therapy dog or uh, the appropriate okay. pet for our elderly parent. A friend was telling me the other day that her son has a, a Great Dane and the, the Great Dane's tail will sweep things off the counter and the table so it's not just coffee tables but right. the dining table and yeah. that a tail like that can knock <laughs> a wobbly person over. Yes, a very fragile elderly person that could be a real danger to them. But the benefits, I think all of us have a gut feeling to say there's a benefit to sure. pet ownership and care. I think there's enough evidence out there that says that people age uh, better, uh, have a healthier mental and emotional uh, uh, framework if they maintain interests, mm -hmm. whatever they are, music, uh, sports, uh, reading, crafts, and also pets and caring for their pets. Mm -hmm. The big difference that I see is that the person with the pet is actually having that interaction with right. another living being instead of just saying well I listen to this music or I play this music on my violin or I, I do this craft here you have a human uh, animal interaction mm -hmm. so there's a much bigger dimension to that and I think that's well, I think a big plus one of the things that we both see when we do home visits with people that don't get out very often is a lot of loneliness yes and um, you know that they've lost a spouse, children are all grown, grandchildren are grown, and, and that the pet can really fill a niche, that need for um, companionship, someone to talk to. I mean, mm -hmm. I know people that talk to their cat over breakfast, um, yes. and someone to cuddle with at night, yes. because a lot of our um, older adults don't get as much touch as we all crave mm -hmm. and need. Mm -hmm. Loneliness, combating the loneliness, when I was thinking about what are the benefits, uh, and combating the loneliness was the first thing that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that there is a really rigorous scientific body of evidence out there to say, oh, having a pet does this and having a pet does that. But I think we can all say mm -hmm. that things like loneliness, uh, people feeling calmer, happier. Uh, there has been scientific research on bringing down stress levels with just stroking the, an animal. As you say, the, the touch, I think particularly in people who suffer from dementia mm -hmm. uh, and maybe are in some Alzheimer's facilities, uh, there's a difference if you have a stuffed cat versus if you have a real cat. And there's a, a much yeah. greater benefit to having a live animal than just having a, a little stuffed toy or something right. like that, that they, they would stroke and they would hold. But it's not the same. So I think definitely the emotional benefits uh, in terms of uh, possibly less depression or helping people to come out of depression because they have something else to focus on. They have their pet. Uh, they have something else that they need to do. Sometimes, depending on, on what people have going on in their lives, they may not have as great of a need or a, a motivation to get up and get going every day. But if you have a pet... The dog needs you, to be walked. <laughs> yes, you have to respond to that. So it gives people maybe a greater time sense and well, a greater we, scheduling. And we also talk all the time about people needing a sense of purpose. Yes. Um, you know, what's my meaning? What's my purpose? Mm -hmm. what, why should I get up in the morning? And if it is to take care of Rocky, <laughs> let's get up and take care of Rocky. And, or if and people feel they're doing a good job with yeah. their pet. Yeah. 
It's a sense of pride, mm -hmm. and it increases their self-esteem. Right. Additionally, depending on the type of pet, and I don't want, I, I know I'm saying dog, predominantly dog and cat, but I think particularly with the elderly, we need to think in a very broad scope that there are other animals that mm -hmm. are maybe even more appropriate. People have birds. Mm -hmm. People have uh, rabbits, yep. uh, fish or pets, other pets. So I don't want to be staying in the stereotype of dog and cat. Right. But if you do have a dog, uh, then I think there's an added benefit for the elderly. If you walk your dog, you get more exercise. And they are doing some studies right now about the effect of this walking of the dog uh, and people's exercise level and degree of uh, exercise and then what the physiologic effects are mm -hmm. for them. Some of the research points... Because exercise is what you need to do for brain health, for physical mm -hmm. health. For Bone strength, osteoporosis, yeah. preventing they fractures, better balance. Same. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, some of the research also indicates that people who own pets have lower blood pressure, mm -hmm and lower cholesterol. Wow. Now possibly the people who are healthy are better able to take care of pets and so there might be a little self-selection there but still uh, it's, it's a nice thought that I hope uh, they keep pursuing and doing the research. In terms of going back to the dog walking though, beyond just saying that people are going to exercise, there's a possibility that it increases their socialization. Mm. We all mm -hmm. see in our neighborhoods mm -hmm. when people are out walking their dog and they meet other people. When I'm out walking and I meet people walking right. their dog, there's a social interaction mm -hmm. that takes place. We stop, we talk, we chat a little bit, and I think there's a great benefit for the elderly to having that, as well as uh, just fine motor uh, coordination and and grooming. just other the grooming the stroking uh, if they are not able to take them for walks and and having major uh, physical activity with their dog or their uh, their animal uh, we also can't discount the sense of security particularly mm, the true. dogs give people mm -hmm. who are alone uh, people can be very nervous they can be worried uh, they're in situations mm -hmm. that maybe no longer are as safe to them uh, and so having their dog gives them that greater sense of security that if something were happening then their dog would alert them uh, or their, their dog right. would help them in some other and way. And we all he read those stories in the newspapers where it was the dog that alerted somebody that there was a fire in the house, that they you know, got a neighbor because they're companion human had fallen or whatever so you know there there's certainly support for those things now yeah. I think that you know some of the things that you've just talked about also make me think about some of the the challenges so you know we all know people that have said oh you know my dad died I think I need to get my mom a dog or a cat because she's so lonely she's mm -hmm. grieving and mm -hmm. you know I hate to see her be so sad so let's talk also about some of the things that adult children should think about before getting mom, dad, or adult. even maybe when they have a pet mm -hmm. I think some things that the adult children should be watching for mm -hmm. or looking at uh, what are you monitoring and maybe uh, the the adult child is a long-distance caregiver mm -hmm. they're not seeing the parent all of the time so when they come what are the things that they could be looking for because things can go wrong in many ways when uh, an elderly person is caring for an animal and it's a good um, signal that there might be other things that the the parent isn't as able to cope with that maybe yes. the lat when you visited a year ago for the holidays things were fine yes. but now when you walk in the house you smell the cat litter yes you can uh, tell that the dog's not going out. Sometimes the dog's, the dog's not healthy. And I don't want to pick on the dogs, <laughs> right. but the dogs, and we've seen this, where the person has had the dog for a number of years. And maybe this is some of the more poignant things that we see because here the person and the dog, they have a great relationship. They have been together for a number of years. And unfortunately, this is a time when 
the elderly person may be suffering many losses, mm -hmm. many diminishments, and here they are no longer physically able to deal with this dog because mm -hmm. this dog is very energetic, requires a lot of care, and a lot of physical force to mm -hmm. walk. Who's walking the dog? Or is the dog walking the person? Right. Well, that, that's so that certainly can something be, we've seen where, you know, a, the dog is pulling someone down the sidewalk and the fall risk then for that older yes. adult is in a danger zone. Yes. I'm thinking also um, of coping with an aging pet because not only do we have aging parents, but then sometimes they've got a, a, an animal that's been a companion for 15 years and now that pet is failing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know people that are carrying the dog out to the backyard and yeah. that's something that your 90-year-old parent may not be able to do, but, but there's such a bond. Physically, they may have real challenges dealing with that. I think when I look at the robustness of so many of our clients, I think that it's not as worrisome for them to be dealing with the emotional problems associated with the dog's decline because I think many times our clients are in better shape to be seeing this. Mm -hmm. They see these things happening in themselves. Uh, they've and dealt so with death more than some of us younger people have. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that part, but it's just can they really do the physical yeah. thing? Can they get the animal to the vet? Can they administer the mm -hmm. care that the animal might need? So that or what could happens be, if the pet becomes incontinent and right. then there's more right. the for physical the physical to take care the of? Physical work. So um, the, the adult child, they may be saying, um, well, maybe they need to take a more active role in this. Yeah. Uh, maybe other decisions need to be made about how the pet will be cared for. Uh, another thing that follows uh, along with this, and um, I actually have two things that re relate to this, uh, where I think that the adult children need to at least be thinking about this. Uh, one thing that we see is if the person is suddenly hospitalized, mm. is mm -hmm. there any plan to care for the animals? Yeah. So there might not be. Mm -hmm. uh, there might not be anyone who can get there quickly enough so or have that So this is a place where neighbors, focus. friends, and family need to step in and yes. think, who's going to care for this? I have a, mm -hmm. a friend who um, is very concerned about animals and does a lot of work with older adults. and one of the things that she advises very strongly is that if any family um, is considering getting a pet for um, an older family member to make sure that you have that backup plan. Yes. What are the things that you may need to take care of but also if something happens to the older adult and they can't take care of them what's your plan? Is it just to take the animal back to the shelter mm -hmm. or is there an mm -hmm. adoption plan in mm -hmm. place? Or and, and sometimes, um, though, I just wanted to say that yes. sometimes those adult children or the f family who are getting the pet also need to think about offering as a part of the package, I will take care of the vet visits, mm -hmm. I will take care of the obedience school <laughs> part, because we need to have, especially with dogs, I think, we need to have pets that are, know some rules, because yes. it's the pets that get outside and chase the first squirrel or run that mm -hmm. pose more of a risk mm -hmm. to our older friends. Yeah. Uh, the other part that I think the adult children need to think about is first, do they have an emergency plan for their parent? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd hope that the answer from everybody is yes, we have the emergency plan. Um, but then if a pet is involved, do, have they also considered that in terms of the emergency? Mm -hmm. So I think those are, those are two things that the adult children can focus on. I think some of the other things in terms of the monitoring, um, the physical care, but then another thing is what about the financial ability mm -hmm. to provide for the animal. And we have seen unfortunately situations where because of the economics of our, our uh, elderly client, there's a real choice there between yeah. how can I be eating and how can my dog be eating. Mm -hmm. 
so I think this is something that somebody needs to be attuned to, whether it is the, uh, and I don't want to put it all on the, the adult children, uh, but I think all of the social contacts that the person has or the community contacts, people have to sort of have a, a high index of suspicion and have these things on their radar that, that uh, is something going wrong here? Is, is there something where we need to, to talk with them and, and maybe see if we can intervene? And that's one of those things that your volunteers could do is to buy the 20 pound bag of dog food and deliver it so that an older person who might not be able to carry 20 pounds of dog food right. can still take care this of, is, of uh, the pet. Yeah, uh, and a number of the clients who are in that 20% who have the pets are also the clients where one of the services they're receiving from us is food shopping. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we, I, I could go on and on with uh, some humorous stories about some of the uh, the food shopping and uh, the shopping list issues, or uh, people who just they might call and they don't necessarily need food shopping, but. Mm -hmm they're running low on cat food yeah. and that's really the priority. Yeah. Uh, another thing to find out is to to really investigate how can people buy these things in bulk mm -hmm. so that they can save money because we deal with a number of clients who really don't have the financial resources so this is very important yet they can't manage the in bulk they can't just go out there and and buy these huge things One, so that's why i think the yeah. the visitors uh, are important there because they have the physical strength right. one to, of the other areas where i've seen people get into trouble with with pets and another sign that the, the person is not coping as well as when um, they, the population of pets gets out of hand. It starts with one cat, there's another cat yes. in the neighborhood, next thing you know you're, you've got a pregnant cat and then you've got a cat and four kittens and within a couple of years you can have 30 cats and that's overwhelming for anyone it, and the, the, the older adult may <clears throat> use those pets or anybody can be any age, can use those pets as a way of trying to fill that empty yes. feeling, the need for loving, but that it can get out of control and then it presents a hazard for that person and often unhappy neighbors. That is a very, very sad situation and we read about it a lot in the paper whenever it occurs. It gets a lot of attention and you think, how did this come to be? Uh, how could there be such uh, lack of awareness, uh, people not really uh, seeing what was going mm -hmm. on? Because this didn't happen overnight. But they sometimes it might be those... not being able, feeling that you can't afford that vet visit to get the cat neutered. And that, um, you know, there again, if people turn to your organization, right. our organization, right. we can help them connect with other nonprofits that provide those services. Right, because this is this is bad for the animals, it's bad for the person. This is really, I think, a lose-lose situation all the way around. So it's something that uh, starts out being a win-win. You've adopted a, an animal, bring right. it home, Right. your family member or your friend is just so much happier. You see the depression lift, you see that sense of purpose, all those wonderful aspects, but then it sort of spins out of control yes. and, and that's a time when other people need to intervene and help get it back under control yes, again. Yes, because this is, there are many unmet needs there. This is, this is a serious emotional and mental issue many yeah. times and people have turned to these animals uh, and one animal is great two animals are not necessarily twice the greatness. <laughs> right. it's, it's an exponential uh, problem. Now, what's your sense of what happens um, when a person does choose or need to go to a residential care community, an assisted living community or um, continuing care or nursing, skilled nursing facility? What then happens with their pets? Because I know In the residential facilities that we work with, uh, the people can bring their their pet or mm -hmm. pets. Uh, what I see a lot of times, though, is that then they could not get new pets. Mm -hmm. So you can bring in they your bring existing their pet. they bring their mm -hmm. existing pet. And I know um, that a lot of the communities that skilled nursing and assisted living have residential 
community pets. Right. I and I don't really Acorn know. Glenn has a community dog. Yes, the, <laughs> it's there right. all the time. Uh, and I think that um, with the skilled nursing, it would really depend on the facility. I could see where someone would say, "I want to come and live here." Uh, could my pet become mm -hmm. a resident pet if the rule is that they yeah. can't have their pet, they can't have it right there? I don't really know. I don't see that uh, in the nursing homes. Well, I think there the needs to be a staff person that really are. takes responsibility for those pets and, and, you know, like if there's a holiday or something, takes, is really caring for them. But, so I don't, I don't think people can take their own pets into skilled nursing, but only if it became a community continuing pet. right continuing like community care pet. or assisted uh, living I think it's a good question to ask when you interview in a place you know mom's got this small dog and we can we bring the dog yeah uh, I think with the the therapy animals uh, either the animal might live there or the staff person brings the animal each day right uh, so but about people needing to move, I would uh, second what you're saying, ask about it ahead of time because I might suspect that some people may be delaying an appropriate move to a residential facility mm -hmm. because they fear they can't take right. their dog or cat right. or they can't have their bird and so they're afraid to ask the question because mm -hmm. they really assume the answer is no. So I would urge them to ask the question and find out, mm -hmm. and they may actually be pleasantly surprised. Uh, we had one of our clients who elected on her own. She could have taken her cat, mm -hmm. but she decided that that just wasn't the right thing. That was not the right move to make for her with the cat, uh, and so she arranged for someone to then adopt her cat. Mm -hmm. So that's how she right. looked at it. So I think what we're trying to say is that pets are wonderful companions, that they can really fill that niche in a time of life that tends to get more isolated and lonely. They can give a sense of purpose um, and that there are some very wonderful aspects of having a pet. Um, but there are some cautions that people need to consider as well, of making sure the pet is w well enough taken care of, making sure there's an emergency plan mm -hmm. for the pet, and making sure that the pet is a good match with yes. the older adult. And that, yes. the, and that you don't just suddenly show up and say, hey, mom, look what I got you. Yes. But that if mom's capable of participating in that decision, that, and, and I think mom would need to be, have that capacity in order to, to get a, add a pet to the household. But that there are lots of positive things and some things to look out for. So. Yes. Thank you so much for joining Thank me. Thank you, Susan. It's been a pleasure. And we'll have Carol Oliveri and the Healthcare Ministry contact information as well as the Princeton Senior Resource Center information up at the end of the show. Thank you.